to uh, adjourn the debate. The question is, this House do now adjourn? This is Diane Abbott. Here, here. Here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In the past few days, we have read in the newspapers of a particularly sad case of a black marine, Mark Parchment, who was subjected to the most horrifying racial abuse and violence in the Marines. Amongst other things, he was subjected to a special initiation for niggers, which involved being soaked with a bucket of urine, being attacked and having his genitals shaved. He was made to carry a spear on parade at all times, and he was routinely taunted and assaulted. These episodes of racial abuse and violence in the armed forces are peculiar tragic, peculiarly tragic, because in all cases they are occurring to young men who actually had more than the normal sense of patriotism and belonging to Britain. And it seems to me, as I say, peculiarly tragic, that young men who really believed they were British, really wanted to serve their country, are being treated in that way. But sadly, the Mark Parchment case is not the only one. It is just one of a series of very sad cases which I wish to draw attention to tonight. Let me begin by saying, however, that black and Asian involvement in the armed forces is not a new thing. The black and Asian peoples have had a relationship with the British armed forces going back to the 18th century. It was during the French Revolutionary Wars that locally recruited black regiments were first raised in the West Indies. In 1914, the Indian Army served with distinction on the Western Front. And by, 1939, by the 1939 to 1945 war, the Indian Army had grown to two and a half million. And thousands, as many as 8,000 West Indians, served with some distinction in the RAF. And I'm often saddened, and black Britons of my generation are often saddened, that when this country remembers the Second World War and remembers who fought and died, the contribution of West Indians and the contributions of Asians can sometimes be forgotten. Yeah. These people came and fought and died for this country because they believed that they were citizens of the empire, citizens of their king and country. And I think it's important, as we remember those who died for this country in the Second World War, we remember the contribution of black and Asian soldiers too. But sadly, despite this historic patriotism and commitment to this country and its armed forces going back centuries, sadly, the army has a history of institutional racism and operating quotas and exclusions. As, as late as 1961, the War Office had a 2% quota on black recruiting. And as late as 1964, the War Office formally banned black and Asian soldiers from the Guards, the Household Cavalry, Scottish regiments, and a number of supporting regiments, including the military police. And in 1967, the army was still operating a formal quota. In 1989, across the Atlantic and the United States. The Americans appointed in 1989 General Colin Powell, the child of West Indian immigrants, as head of the Joint Chief of Staffs in the United States. That's what was happening in the United States. And I don't think anybody would argue, even members opposite, who are quick to talk about tokenism and positive discrimination, I don't think anybody would argue that General Colin Powell didn't serve his country with distinction. But what was the British Armed Forces doing during that period? 
Well, during that period, <coughs> the British Armed Forces' progress towards even the basics of racial equality was painfully slow. It's important to remind the House that the Commission for Racial Equality first took up the issue of racism in the armed forces with the military 17 years ago. And throughout the 80s and the 90s, the British Armed Forces have spent their time in denial of the problem. As late, in, late as 1990, the Under Secretary of State for the, for the Ministry of Defence, Lord Aaron, was saying the armed services have done all they can to stamp out racism. Tell that to Richard Stokes, who joined the Household Cavalry in 1990, desperately proud to join the Household Cavalry, the first black man to join it in its history, a history, as I say, up until the 60s, of a formal ban on black men joining the Household Cavalry. He joined the Household Cavalry in 1990, desperately proud, driven out by hate mail, racial abuse and violence. Tell that to Jacob Malcolm, who in 1991 was barred from the Household Cavalry because of his colour. Tell that to Stephen Anderson, another black man who in 1991 was awarded damages for years of racial abuse. Tell that to Mark Campbell, who in 1994, Mark Campbell was the first black man in the lifeguard. He was eventually driven out because of the taunts of nigger, the abuse, the violence, the bed soaked with human urine. And in 1994 again, George Mackay was awarded damages by the armed forces. He was one of the brightest recruits in basic training. But on his very first parade, his sergeant said to the rest of the assembled troops, we've got a nigger in the troop, lads, inevitably like the others I have mentioned, he was driven out by abuse and violence and eventually the army had to pay damages. And it is no surprise with that history of violence and abuse and racism that if you ask black and Asian young people about the armed forces, even black and Asian young people who've actually joined service cadet corps, two thirds of them believe there is racism in the armed forces. And the situation we have today is that black and Asian candidates, when they do come forward, are a third less successful than white candidates, and that's a curious statistic. And when you look at the numbers of black and Asian people in the armed services, there are only 1% of black and Asian people in the armed services, compared to 5% of black and Asian people in the civil service, and 6% in the population as a whole. And there's only a handful of black and Asians above the rank of colonel. It seems to me very sad that the armed forces have continued with their denial of the existence of racism in the services and have had to be painfully dragged into the 20th century under the threat of a formal investigation by the CRE. Now I know in the autumn of last year, the armed forces launched a big new initiative to recruit more ethnic minorities and to bring some of their personnel practices up to modern day standards and also to implement some measure of ethnic monitoring. But it seems to me that it's important that this process is now monitored very carefully by government. 17 years it's taken the armed forces to get to this stage. We hear all the time about the difficulties of recruiting suitable people into the services, and yet they are recruiting for a potential pool of recruits, black and Asian young men and women in, 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 in our big cities and our communities are so painfully underrepresented in the armed services. It's taken 17 years to get the armed services to this point and many people, Richard Stokes, as I've said, was one of the, uh, was what the, the first black man to join the Household Cavalry. People like Geoffrey Mackay, people like Solomon Raza, an Asian, who was abused and beaten on a daily basis 
because his father was a Pakistani until eventually one of those beatings put him in hospital with a ruptured kidney and he had to leave the services. It has taken many bright, idealistic young black and Asian men to be terrified, to be abused and to be brutalised to have reached us to this point. But the point we've reached, you know, is only the stage at which any modern business would be in terms of personnel practice and in terms of basic number taking and monitoring. And what I want to say to the House this evening is just this. Black and Asian people in the Indian subcontinent, in Africa, in the Caribbean, have a history of loyalty to the British Crown which goes back generations, which goes back centuries. They want to serve. They want to serve their country. They are being kept out, I believe, partly through fear of these well-documented cases of abuse and maltreatment. What the black, black and Asian community and the wider community wants to see from ministers and wants to see from the armed forces is not just policies on paper, not just a verbal commitment, not just lip service to this issue, they want to see a very real commitment. They want to see a line drawn behind the history on this issue. They want to see the armed services really reaching out to young black and Asian people saying, you are welcome and once in, you will be treated as equals. And so then, the brutality and the humiliation that the Richard Stokes and the Mark Campbells and the Stephen Andersons and the Geoffrey Mackays and the Solomon Razas and yes, the brutality and humiliation that the Mark Parchments have had to suffer will not have been in vain. Yeah. Dr.